Hi everyone, welcome to this video on pragmatic analysis as a critical lens for critical media studies. I'm really excited about this one. I love pragmatic analysis, probably because I'm a, a pragmatic guy. I'm a very practical guy, so and just interested in all these things. So, uh, so a lot of this just makes sense to me, and I love looking at things through this pragmatic lens. But anyway, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a look at pragmatic analysis. So pragmatic analysis examines artifacts from a perspective that assesses truth in terms of effect, outcome, and practicality. And so those are the key things we want to keep in mind. Effect, outcome, and practicality really determine um, the purpose and the, the meaning of an artifact and, and its utility. That's really, it's a very utilitarian um, lens that we're looking through here with pragmatic analysis. So, um, so what do we mean by that? What are the major premises of of pragmatic analysis. Well, first of all, pragmatic analysts, uh, people looking at this lens would say that truth should be based on tangible results and possible consequences. So in other words, truth is not this kind of metaphysical idea that exists out in the ether. Truth exists in the world of reality. Truth is, is what happens. What is the resulting outcome and, and the impact of this thing that we're talking about? Um, so, so truth is based on these tangible results and these possible consequences. However, truth is, is also dependent on contextual factors. And so this really is important when we look at things uh, in its place in history. So if we look at things from the perspective of, okay, we have this artifact and, and maybe today it seems totally outlandish or unreasonable or, or maybe just that it doesn't hold up very well. But what was the uh, truth of that time, so to speak, right? Um, what is the truth of that time? Um, and, and in the simplest form, we can look at, at things like this and say, well, we look at old shows. Like I, when I was growing up, I loved Gilligan's Island. Loved the show Gilligan's Island. It was on reruns all the time. I watched it every chance it was on. And not too long ago, it was on, and I thought, oh my gosh, I love Gill Gilligan's Island. I'll watch this episode. And I realized, well, that really doesn't hold up very well. You know, it, it was really good for that time. And at, the, at that time, it was really good. But but now it just doesn't really hold up all that well in, in a lot of respects. So uh, so you really have to place that artifact in that place in time and, and, and measure it and weigh it against uh, what was uh, what was true or what was appropriate at that time. So truth is dependent on that con on contextual factors, though, such as its place in time and uh, and things like that. So uh, habits, uh, pragmatic analysts would say habits are changeable qualities that predispose us to future action. So habits are uh, formed sociologically. They're things that are, they're, they're not things that are ingrained within us naturally. They are things that, that are built within us sociologically and, and uh, through, uh, through our engagement with others. And so because of that, they can be changed and, and things do change and things do evolve over time. But these habits then predispose us to particular future actions. So these are these are all things that are important to keep in mind as we look at pragmatic analysis. These are things that they would say are essentially true. These are these are um, the facts of of what we're dealing with here. Uh, habits are also socialized. I mentioned this. Okay, so habits are socialized. Um, they're they're and they're changeable qualities, and they do predispose us to future actions. We can kind of predict and have an idea of what somebody's going to do based on previous habits. Society is constantly evolving. I can I mention this before? We are constantly evolving, so that's why it's important to place things in context in time and what was uh, what was happening at that time, what was appropriate at that time. What was you know that's an important consideration for us. Just the idea of of time in all this and the fact that we are we are not the same today as we were 15, 20 years ago, or however many years ago, um, as a society, as individuals, or any other way. So we are constantly evolving. Our expectations of what is is good and what is bad, so to speak, are constantly evolving and changing. And uh, so society is a constantly evolving system. So the, the bottom line here in terms of the major premises are that artifacts are then regulated by the norms and the context of that specific time. As these artifacts, when they're created and, and they're, they're, they're judged and regulated and created within that certain time and, and within the context of that specific time, and that matters. The norms in the context of that time matter in the development and the interpretation of those uh, this artifact, and it, and it can't be separated. We can't just separate that artifact from that historical context. Um, so uh, also, the, the you know, it boils down to the bottom line here is that good in, in terms of pragmatic analysis, good would be defined as anything that is beneficial or corrective for that society. 
anything that has a positive impact on that society, anything that, that benefits people in that society or corrects some issue, correct, you know, is an effort to correct some wrong would be termed as good, would be identified as good. And bad would be the opposite of that. Anything that is not beneficial or does not uh, act in a corrective way toward uh, some ill in that society would be considered bad. Okay? So good is beneficial and corrective. Bad is not beneficial and not corrective. Okay? That's the umbrella. That's the nutshell version of pragmatic analysis. Okay. So those are those are the deep types of things we need to keep in mind in terms of major premises. As far as contemporary perspectives on how this affects us with media today in our examination of critical studies of the media today, the contemporary perspectives come down to really kind of two major ideas. Consequences is the first one. This idea that, uh, that is Newton point, not every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So for everything that we do, there's going to be consequences. Sometimes those consequences are good. Sometimes they're bad, as we just identified. Good in this context would be uh, the consequence benefits or correct something in society, and bad would be that it does not do those things. So, But every everything we put out in the world, is going in terms of media is going to have consequences and every decision we make about regulating the media and regulating that output is going to have consequences right both good and bad sometimes they're they're going to be effective and regulations that help us improve society and that have a positive impact on society and other times they're regulations that have a negative impact and and end up setting us back. So every every action that we take is going to um, have a consequence then. Okay. It's going to have a cause and effect identified with it. Uh, then also contingencies. This idea that that everything that we do, there's a there's a but, there's an exception, there's a you know a variety of things like that that are going to be involved as well. So in terms of American media today, we look at things like free speech and public interest. That's a contingency. We make regulations about media. We make identification about good and bad in media. But we also have to identify this balance between free speech and public interest, and what's you know which, what falls in which category. What falls under free speech? What is public interest? So um, things like, you know, social media is a, is a massive area for this right now, right? Some contingencies. We, should we regulate social media? Should we be regulating posts? Is it, or is this a matter of free speech or public interest? The, the COVID vaccinations are the, uh, the idea um, of COVID vaccinations has been a, has been a spark point for uh, some of these things, right? For the idea that, well, I can say what I want. On this is my Facebook page. It's my Twitter account. It's my Instagram. Whatever I should be free to say whatever I want. That's in the First Amendment, right? It's free speech. I can do whatever I want. But what if you're what you're saying is deemed to have a negative impact on uh, public interest, on the public interest, on on keeping people safe? That would be the argument of some people that that if you're if you're you know exercising free speech, that's fine. But what you're saying is harming other people potentially. Right? So where's that balance? Where's that regulation? Well, do we regulate social media? And if we do so, are we violating free speech? But if we don't do so, if we choose not to, are we putting public interest at risk, which would be bad in a pragmatic sense as well, right? So when we look at artifacts in a pragmatic sense, we need to think about those types of contingencies, for example, in the regulation of free speech and public interest. Another area would be government regulation and media self-regulation. At this idea of how involved should the government be in regulating um, these items, uh, as opposed to the the media um, outlets themselves. So we think about it, this really started with like movies, movie ratings and things. But in a more contemporary sense, we have you know video game ratings, for example, and it's all kind of the same idea, right? You, if you if you're a video game person, you may see these ratings, or if you go to a movie or you buy a, a CD, you may see these ratings, right? And these ratings, it says content rated by the ESRB. And uh, it's important to note that these are not uh, the ESRB and the, and the organizations that develop ratings for movies and, and music uh, also are not government institutions. They are not affiliated with the government. They are not connected with the government. The government does not regulate these things in part because the media organizations have decided to do it themselves, which is really pretty smart because the government back in the day with movies, especially was about to, um, was, uh, was about to regulate these things and to say, you know, we gotta, we gotta protect children from seeing these horror movies or seeing movies that have, um, that have, you know, nudity and things like that. We need to let the, let the audience know the government was about to step in and do that. And the movie industry said, we don't really want the government regulating what we do. So let's just do it ourselves. Let's find some way to do it ourselves. And that's what they did. And now 
lots of major industries do this, right? That the, the movie industry does it. The video game industry does this. They identify different levels that they think appropriate. But so there's, there's something to be said for, you know, is this a government regulation or is this self-regulation from the media or, or whatever uh, other uh, of, uh, industry that you're talking about? But, you know, in our context, we're talking about media. So um, there are contingencies for these things. And, and, and that depends on the kind of the, uh, the era as well. We need to put those in historical context. So there are consequences to all these things, um, but there are also then contingencies and things that impact, you know, uh, how we, how we regulate and how we identify these things. So uh, some issues in media regulation in general, just some, just some issues in media regulation. Uh, first, the first group of these would fall under media ownership. There's an issue, issues within media ownership. So for example, uh, combating monopoly, is an issue um, that, that media regulation um, seeks to work on. And, and through pragmatic analysis, we can look at that. How is this effort working to combat monopoly or, or working for or against media regulation? How is that impacting things? So, But regulation oftentimes will seek to combat a monopoly of a particular industry and, and, and which would restrict uh, free competition, for example, in a capitalist economy. Theoretically, that's what we want. We want that competition. Um, protecting intellectual property becomes a, an issue in media regulation, um, and it's really one of those things that can be very challenging to to regulate uh, and and to protect the the intellectual property. First of all, establishing what exactly is intellectual property, where does it begin, and where does it end for an industry and and for a, for a particular artifact, and and then uh, uh, you know it's uh, um, uh, but it's something that that is regulated and. and Again, all these regulations have consequences and also contingencies and so forth, so it, it can get complicated in some ways. Right? Maintaining national security is another media regulation issue. Uh, th there are these chips in there that allow the government kind of to uh, have an easier way to kind of, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say track, I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole of, you know, the government is tracking all of us and controlling all of us and so forth, but there are ways that they can, I mean, for what they would identify as national security issues that they can, um, identify trigger words and different things like that uh, in, and be able to monitor uh, communication via uh, electronic means. Um, so in order to maintain national security, there are government regulations in place, both in uh, the hardware of, uh, of technologies, communication technologies, and also other aspects of the media as well. So we have those issues kind of in the media ownership realm. We also have media content where, where we have media regulation happening and, and, and that can create issues as well. Again, anytime you have regulation, there are consequences, there are contingencies and so forth. So at one point, the government was big on promoting diversity. And uh, what we mean here is by diversity of ideas, really. Uh, they wanted uh, free and fair exchange and opportunities for all different viewpoints to be heard on anything that was you know, publicly held, like radio stations air on public airwaves and things. So, and network television does the same thing. So they were required to have these programs that offered diversity of thought. And, and what they found was actually there was more limiting factors in, in trying to regulate that uh, and trying to mandate that and regulate that. So, but promoting diversity is an, is an issue in media regulation. We also see managing morality, which is, you know, first of all, the question of, is that the government's role to manage morality? to manage, you know, to say, well, this is immoral and should not be on the air. It should not be able to be a part of media, uh, you know, and then you get into the whole obscenity thing with the Supreme Court and the, the famous uh, Supreme Court justices that said, you know, how do you, how do you uh, define um, um, obscenity or pornography? And he said, I know it when I see it, you know, it's one of the things, you know, when you say, so how do we manage something like that? Though, that's different for each person. How, how do we manage uh, morality. How do we establish that framework as a, as an as an institution and regulate that in the media? Then that presents challenges, and then ensuring accuracy. You know, I use this as fake news, but fake news really has a different meaning. What we're talking about here is false news, things that are actually untrue. Fake news is more identified with I don't like that, so I'm going to identify that as fake and and call it fake. False news is just flat out inaccurate, right? So um, we want to ensure accuracy, but that requires regulation as well. So again, all of these things. And may be important. Each of them may be important in some way, but they're also very complicated because, again, every issue, every regulation has consequences. It has contingencies. It has, you know, exclusions and things you have to take into account. So uh, there are lots of issues in media regulation. Then, 
So if we were to look at some common questions that we ask maybe in pra pragmatic analysis when we're uh, employing pragmatic analysis, some common questions would, would include, when was the artifact created? Again, that historical context is incredibly important. What were the prevailing social norms at that time? Uh, does this artifact conform to those norms? Does it fall into the norms there? And, and, and again, we need, to, if, we need to judge it according to that contextual time frame. And then would this artifact at, at the time have been seen as beneficial? Again, in that context, in that historical context, would it be seen as beneficial? So I want to take a look at a couple of different uh, uh, shows, TV shows here. I thought we'd put a couple of different TV shows here and look at kind of compare and contrast them and because they come from different eras. Uh, but uh, I want to look at the Cosby show and Martin. Okay. Two two uh, popular television shows, Cosby Show in the '80s, Martin really in the '90s, uh, late '90s, early 2000s. So, uh, and we're gonna okay, I get we're gonna set aside the whole Bill Cosby thing and just look at the Cosby Show, which at the time was a major, influential show. Okay. I, I'm not setting I, I, and setting aside not to excuse what Bill Cosby is uh, has allegedly done or was convicted of doing, but uh, but just to look at the at the piece of media without and setting aside that 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 particular uh, added. Um, piece to this. Okay. So the Cosby show in the eighties was immensely popular. Martin was really popular as, as well. Not as quite a, a broad enough audi an audience for mainstream an audience as a Cosby show, but both um, very important uh, and especially very important in uh, representation of African-Americans in television in in network television, which at the time was rare, especially for the Cosby show. That was really the first um, presentation of an African-American family on, on major television that had that kind of audience. Uh, and then Martin introduced a, a kind of a different uh, viewpoint uh, of African American life, what some people call a more realistic one, um, and more. Uh, but uh, but then there was also the issue on Martin with one of the characters that that Martin Martin Lawrence actually portrayed was uh, this character named Shanene, right? Which some people felt like was a was a characterization and really kind of in some ways uh, a, a a negative portrayal of African Americans and was kind of a stereotype representing a stereotype of what people had in their mind that an African American woman of that age and that time um, was like, and maybe, and you know, probably not, not a fair representation necessarily, and maybe a negative stereotype there. So let's take a look at these though, just in, in terms of pragmatic analysis, uh, when was the artifact created the Cosby show again in the eighties um, and the, the Martin, uh, program aired in the you know late 90s mid to late 90s maybe into the early 2000s um so that's when they were created they were created at different times what were the prevailing social norms at the time uh, especially in television the social norms in the 80s were very um uh, bland compared to today there was you know really on network television there was no cursing there was absolutely no nudity of any kind uh, and there were really no were, was no cursing and it was very um, what they would have called family friendly so to speak and not very edgy Kind of, kind of uh, smooth. Keep everything low key. Keep everything smooth. Keep everybody happy. Right in the '90s, you started to see a little more of an edge to television, especially um, when Martin came around on the Fox network. Um, it was really Fox was was just starting out. It was one of the first major programs in the Fox network, and at that time, Fox was really trying to appeal to the African American audience, and so they developed shows around, uh, developed several programs around uh, African American characters, and that that. Uh, highlighted African-American characters. That was not the case in the eighties when the Cosby show was on again, you, you, you would have been hard pressed to find uh, much diversity at all in the casts of television shows in the eighties. It was, it was pretty homogenous, pretty, pretty white, pretty Caucasian. Um, so the Cosby show stood out because of that. Um, and also just, you know, the, the idea that they were portraying um, African-Americans when they were portrayed were not really usually portrayed as professionals. But uh, Cliff Huxtable was a, as a, a doctor. Claire was a lawyer. They, they were professionals in high end professions. And so that was that was unique at the time. And so um, th there were there were norms uh, that they were breaking in that regard. But uh, uh, but Martin broke a lot of norms, you know, really introduced people to what we would call maybe a more accurate portrayal of that time period of an African-American um, uh, cast and a group of, a group of people um, that, that really, I can tell you from, from the perspective of somebody who grew up in a very, very small town and a very, very white area. Um, that was some of my first exposure really to, to African-American culture, you know, especially in a, in a larger city like that. And uh, so it was, you know, it was really a, a cultural experience for me. So it, it really did, I, go against in some ways the social norms at the time. Uh, 
did did it conform to those norms? You know, again, the Cosby Show did in a lot of ways, apart from the um, the 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 ethnicity and the and the um, racial background of the the cast. Um, it did conform to a lot of norms on television. Uh, the, the the basic setup was there. Uh, Martin did not necessarily. It introduced a lot, some different things. It was really very creative in the way that it uh, did not conform to the norms of what we expected from network television at that time. Again, Fox was looking for edgier content. And so the Martin program had a lot of, uh, I think, a leeway in in uh, pushing the envelope in that way. So it was it was really quite interesting in that way. And would it have been seen as beneficial at that time? I think so. I think both of them were viewed uh, positively at the time. Again, the Cosby Show for the representation of uh, of an African American family that was um, really more positive, probably than most of the views that you would have gotten on uh, other programs. And just the fact that there was such a diverse cast and and had had a lot of um, uh, representation in the cast of different uh, different races and different ethnicities and, and things like that uh, would have been seen as beneficial at the time and expanding the horizons of many people. Martin, the same way, I think. Again, it had a smaller audience. It was a little more edgy. It was probably geared more toward younger people in particular, but I think it was beneficial at the time. Um, despite the, some of the, the, the kind of the stereotypes that it portrayed maybe negatively um, I, that the people might've held about the African-American community. Uh, but I think overall it was really was a, a positive representation and really um, uh, provided a window for many people into uh, to, to, to that world, to, to what it was like to, to be uh, a, you know, a youngish African-American person in the United States in a city at that time, you know, so I think it, it would have been seen as beneficial at that time as having a benefit for society. Both of the programs would have. Okay. That just gives you a little insight, a little my perspective on pragmatic analysis. So uh, I hope you uh, will continue to explore the idea of pragmatic analysis on your own, thinking about things in a very practical way, very, very much. Uh, does this have a benefit or does it not? And is it appropriate for that contextual time frame or not? And is the regulation that that is uh, that is represented in this media or that was that was uh, employed at that time appropriate or not? Those are the types of questions we look at in pragmatic analysis. If you have questions about this or any other content related to critical media studies, I hope you'll feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you in that regard. In the meantime, get out there and uh, start and uh, continue looking at, at media through these different lenses, including now the pragmatic uh, analysis lens and uh, and being able to to look at media in a different uh, different ways and, and different aspects. So, and I hope you just have a a great week, everyone.